from MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. And good morning and welcome to Montana This Morning on this March 15th, 2022. We do begin this morning with the latest on the war in Ukraine. Well, the city of Mary Opal is emptying as a part of the first successful evacuation in two weeks. Plus, another round of peace talks is scheduled between Russia and Ukraine. The two sides are expressing hope that something can be done, but U.S. officials do not believe Putin wants a diplomatic solution. Ukraine will ask for immediate withdrawal of troops and security guarantees. So far, the Russian offensive is largely stalled on the ground, but the Kremlin responded by stepping up its aerial barrage. Missiles continue to rain down on Kyiv and those other key cities. Well, the White House says economic sanctions imposed on Russia have already caused a financial crisis there. The Treasury Department predicts the Kremlin will soon have to decide how far the fund, how fun to, far to fund the war in Ukraine. The Russia government is threatening to repay foreign debts in rubles instead of dollars or euros. Experts say that doing so would trigger a default. President Volodymyr Zelensky will deliver a virtual address to U.S. Congress tomorrow, and he is expected to urge lawmakers to send more military and humanitarian aid. It comes as some cities are running out of their last reserves for food and for water. And we are checking in on the weather now with our Miller Robson. It's going to be a good day today for temperatures. Yes, if you like the 60s, well... Bring on those 60s. Yeah, good chance yeah. a good bit of the area may actually get into the low 60s today. Wow. So not a nice change of pace. Looking Warmer good. than normal yesterday as yeah. well. But we're going to cool down the next couple of days. We do have a back, and I say a backdoor cold front. We're going to have colder air on the back end of that cold front, I should say, uh, as we move forward. But by, by the time we get to the weekend, by the time we get to officially spring on Sunday, trying to get back to the 60s again. Let's crunch some numbers real quick. Yesterday, our high of 57 above average. Overnight low of 34 above average. No precipitation yesterday to speak of, but for the month we're still pacing ahead by a tenth of an inch. For the year, two tenths of an inch, uh, an inch on the plus side. Even the snow, we're over two inches on the on the plus side in terms of the month, and since July 1st we're closing in, or just under three inches on the positive side as well. We don't have a lot of moisture this week to talk about, but we could see some rain and snow, especially off to our west and south. Uh, temperature out there right now, 45 in Billings. Feels like 38. Winds out the southwest at about 17 miles an hour. Uh, it's a, not a bad start out there. Temperatures in the 30s and 40s with a lot of 60s for highs today under mostly cloudy skies. A complete lit your forecast is coming up here in just a bit. What do you think? I mean, do you think hitting 60 degrees today is going to damper kind of those levels for precipitation? And well, you know, we could always use moisture. You know, with the drought situation out there, we're still very, very dry. The only place in our region, really, in the north, northwest corner of uh, Montana, and they're, and they're the ones getting the snow. They're yeah. the ones getting the precipitation the next couple of days, you lucky devils. But, uh, yeah, we could always use some moisture, just not, not a whole lot. Okay, well, we'll enjoy it while we can. Yep, absolutely. All right, Miller, thanks okay. so much. All right, well, this morning we are tracking the influx of reported stolen vehicles in Billings and this type of crime. It's often pretty difficult for Billings police to actually solve. As Q2's Casey Conlon tells us, it can happen to anyone at any time. It's a typical morning. I leave the house, turn the corner toward my driveway and get ready to head to work, only to realize my car is gone. Statistically, this happens to three people every day in Billings. Police reported nearly 1,000 stolen cars last year. The issue isn't new. Billings ranked 15th in auto theft rate in 2017, and that rose all the way to 8th in 2020. The difference now, though, is that because of the rise in more high-profile crimes, prosecuting these criminals, let alone recovering your car, is getting harder and harder. I walked back out and I looked out the window, and my car was gone. April Todd never thought something like this would happen to her, especially not at 2.30 in the afternoon on a Monday. I went to the gym and then I went to go get my keys and they were gone. Someone walked into the gym locker room, took the keys from Todd's bag, and by the time Todd finished her workout, her car was gone. It kind of stops everything that you have planned and everything that you have going on. We'd key up all the vehicles and they'd come right on, drive it right off the, the front of the lot in the middle of the day. Car dealerships aren't even immune. Josh Gardapi is a sales associate with Auto Magic on a busy intersection near the Metro. We're not allowed to put gas in the tanks, you know, for the customers. That's that's kind of a car sale thing, you know, fill the tank up for your customer. Like, we, we just can't do it. We can't keep gas on the lot because it gets stolen. 
The new policy came in handy last month when thieves came at night and stole this Jeep SRT8. It was found a couple of miles down the road in Lockwood, but in rough shape. It's, we have to have it completely replaced. Costs that come out of the dealership or individual's pocket when there's no one else to charge. It was dark, uh, hood, masks, gloves, you know, we can't really tell who it is. So unless they catch them in the vehicle, I mean, we're pretty much have no idea. That's the real tragedy behind this all is it's really hard to hold many people accountable for every single one of those. In reality, five out of every six go unpunished, according to BPD statistics that show an arrest is made in just 17% of motor vehicle theft cases. It's why the department started the Street Crimes Division. There was a gap there that we needed a proactive enforcement portion for that area that involved like property crimes, theft, burglary, motor vehicle theft numbers were a major driving force in, in that. It worked for a while. Numbers went down in 2018 and 19. But now the five officer street crimes division isn't enough. The latest public safety mill levy will eventually add more patrol officers, but there are other challenges, including BPD's compelling need pursuit policy. Oh no! Oh, that's it! Pursuits are very dangerous. Uh, and at the end of the day, when you look at motor vehicle theft, it's property. Granted, it is somebody else's property. Uh, it is not worth risking innocent members in the community and their lives uh, with reckless driving and chasing at high speeds through the city to, to do that. Um, and what we oftentimes see is, is a majority of the motor vehicles that are stolen that we try to stop, a majority of them do flee on us. Uh, so it's very hard for us at times to find stolen vehicles with people inside of them. Bottom line, getting your car back is usually the best you can hope for. It was enough for Todd, who got the good news five days later. What was your reaction? Ecstatic. Getting the car back is way more important than her being prosecuted. For you personally. For me personally. Though even this case doesn't have a truly happy ending. She took my wallet and has a social security card, driver's license. I shut my cards down before the cops got there, but... Uh, but that's still something you're worried about. Mm -hmm. And oh, it yeah. will be for Huge. a while. Huge. Well, that, that, now I have to replace those things. I thought and going to the gym at 2.30 in the afternoon was a pretty safe activity. Those are becoming harder and harder to find. Casey Conlon, MTN News. Happening today, the Federal Reserve will meet, and there is likely that the interest rates will go up again. The Fed will also consider making adjustments to the country's economic outlook and projections for future rate hikes. Economists expect a discussion about when the Fed can start reducing holdings in its bond portfolio. The expected hike would be the first since 2018. Visitors may soon be allowed back inside the U.S. Capitol. Officials are considering a phased reopening, and it would start with increasing the number of official business visitors from 9 to 15. Staff-led tours would be allowed to resume with a limit of 15, and the Capitol shut down to visitors two years ago due to the pandemic. The Omicron variant is fueling a COVID-19 surge in China, forcing widespread lockdowns. But in the U.S., cases of the virus have plunged to the lowest level in eight months. On Monday, California lifted its mandatory mask requirement at schools, leaving the decision to local school districts. All right, we now officially know every single person running for office in the 2022 state election. As MTN's Jonathan and Barian tells us, there are some interesting races to keep an eye on. The doors are closed here at the Montana Secretary of State's office, and so is the two-month window for candidates to file to run in the 2022 state elections. The Secretary of State reported 40 more filings Monday, before the deadline at 5 p.m. Altogether, 287 people have filed to run for state legislature, and 46 more for the other state races on the ballot. Unsurprisingly, the most crowded fields are in the races for Montana's two new congressional districts. In District 1 in western Montana, where former Congressman Ryan Zinke is trying to return to the House, he's one of five Republican candidates. They also include former state senator Al Olszewski, businesswoman Mary Todd, Matt Jetty of Missoula, and Mitch Hoyer of Whitefish. 
Three Democrats are running, health policy expert Cora Newman, attorney Monica Trinnell, and former state representative Tom Winter. A libertarian is also in the race. In District 2 in eastern and central Montana, incumbent Matt Rosendale will be in the Republican primary with Kyle Austin of Billings, James Boyette of Bozeman, and Charles Walkingchild of Helena. On the Democratic side, the candidates are State Senator Mark Sweeney, former Billings City Councilwoman Penny Ronning, and Skylar Williams of Billings. Three Libertarians and an Independent also filed. On Monday, Montana Public Service Commission Chair James Brown filed for state Supreme Court. He's running against incumbent Justice Ingrid Gustafson of Billings and District Court Judge Michael McMahon of Helena. Supreme Court Justice Jim Rice is also running for re-election against Bill Dalton of Billings. You can find a full breakdown of all the candidate filings on our website. Now we'll shift our attention to the primary campaigns. The primary election is set for June 7th. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. And the price for a gallon of gas is holding pretty steady in Montana, still over $4 on average. But you can save some money memberships with places like Costco and other wholesale stores. They do offer the best discounts. Even things like replacing dirty air filters and faulty spark plugs help the engine burn less fuel. And keeping your tires properly inflated can also lead to savings as you drive down the road. We do have an update this morning on our friend and former anchor of this show, Victoria Hill. She's pretty busy these days, launching a brand new position for the city of Billings. As Q2's Alina Howder explains, Victoria is still doing something she's always been super great at, keeping you informed. From TV anchor to the city's first public information officer, I got the chance to speak with Victoria Hill on what exactly a PIO does and how she'll serve the city in this completely new role. I'm Victoria Hill, thank you so very much. From in front of the camera to behind the scenes, Victoria Hill is still serving the public, but not as a journalist. Next to us. She's the city of Billings' first ever public information officer. A lot of the feedback that the city leaders and city council members and the mayor got was that the community really wants to know what's going on behind the scenes. This is where Victoria comes in. Through social media, newsletters, and press releases, it's her job to give the community a closer look at what's going on in each city department. I'm going to do education and public outreach and fill everyone in on the things they aren't seeing day to day. This is a great way to show them how their tax dollars are being put to work. Victoria accompanied the fire department as they checked out the new terminal at the Billings Airport. Just in case of an emergency situation, they never know what they'll get into. So when this thing is up and running, they'll have a smooth entry in. She took photos of firefighters as they made their way through the building, capturing the moments that the public usually wouldn't see. And her 10 years of TV experience certainly helps. I've been able to take a lot of what I've learned over the years and apply it here. It's a lot of storytelling. It's a lot of people to people interaction and sharing their story. Very similar to what she was doing before, but had a very different schedule. I'm still doing on uh, some scale what what I enjoy doing the most is just not getting up at, you know, two in the morning. My eyes are still opening at one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning. And then I get to tell myself, OK, you get to close your eyes for a few more hours. So that's been pretty nice. Even though she's no longer a Q2's morning anchor. Viewers reaching out to me, telling me that they're happy for me, but that they miss me, of course. And that just means the world to me. Victoria is still very much a part of the Billings community. I'm still part of their lives in some way, but more, um, I guess, behind the scenes. In Billings, I'm really glad I'm here. Alina Howder, MTN News. As much as we miss her, we love seeing her in that brand new role.